Judy asked me to pull together a little talk, just updating you on what's happening in the field of eating disorders genetics and just talking a little bit about what the research actually means. So as you probably already know, studies are ongoing that are trying to identify regions of the genome that influence risk for anorexia nervosa, bulimia nervosa, binge eating disorder, and ARFID. And anorexia is far ahead of the others, and that's mostly due to where the funding came from. Uh, but the other disorders are catching up. In fact, over the next five years, and really over the next year and a half, you're going to see a lot more new research coming out on binge eating behavior and on avoidant restrictive food intake disorder, or ARFID. So in terms of anorexia, um, as you probably already know, we have identified eight regions of the genome um, that are implicated in risk for anorexia nervosa. And we have shown that both psychiatric and metabolic factors underlie the illness. Now, this is really important, but some people might still say, so what? Um, the fact that we, what does it mean that we identified that there are both psychiatric and metabolic components to anorexia nervosa? The way I've been thinking about this lately is to go sort of back into my own history and think about what I was taught about eating disorders during my training, and then to compare how far we've come. So I'll take you back there just for a minute because it's both enlightening and a little bit painful. So I was taught all about Sigmund Freud, thinking that anorexia nervosa was primarily a fear of oral impregnation. I was taught that Salvador Mnuchin had identified a type of psychosomatic family that was marked by families being overprotective and rigid, having difficulty resolving conflict and being very enmeshed or sort of up in each other's business. And I was taught the theories of Arthur Crisp, who said that anorexia nervosa was a morbid reaction to puberty and a flight from maturity. Now, all of these theories were fine, um, but in reality, I think both Freud and Crisp sort of underestimated women's understanding and perception of their own biology. And I think Mnuchin actually got the direction of causality wrong. Uh, you know, he saw these families that came to him in distress. And sure, if you're worried to death about your child dying from starvation, you're going to become overprotective and you're going to become enmeshed. So I think he really did sort of get the, he had the arrow pointing the wrong way. Um, he was seeing the result of anorexia nervosa, not the cause. So questions that I commonly get now are, if I had an eating disorder, will my children develop eating disorders? If one of my children had an eating disorder, are the others at increased risk of developing one too? And is there a genetic test for anorexia, bulimia, ARFID, and other eating disorders? And I'm getting this last question more and more often because there are always new companies that are popping up that are claiming that they can do genetic tests for a whole host of illnesses and psychiatric disorders, including eating disorders. So I think one of the hardest things about being human is also one of the most amazing things about being human. And that is that we can actually think complexly and we can understand probabilities, even if we would prefer things to be a lot simpler. And that's really what we're talking about here when we're talking about eating disorders risk. So when we look at this research, a couple of things are perfectly clear. First, it is not just one gene. So it's not like if you have this whole deck of cards and all of a sudden there's a joker thrown in that that means, boom, you're going to get anorexia or you're going to get bulimia. Um, we know that eating disorders, like all other psychiatric disorders, are complex traits. And what that means is that there are hundreds, if not thousands of genes, each one of which has just a small or a moderate effect, but they act in concert and they act together with environmental factors as well. So we really do have to embrace that complexity when we're trying to understand genetic factors and how they influence eating disorders. So I've been trying to figure out ways to take this super complex topic and make it just a little bit more understandable, um, but also at the same time capture them complexity. And I've landed on this sort of analogy of a deck of cards. And I think about the four different factors or the four different suits in a deck of cards that can influence risk for an eating disorder. So let's start with the spades and those might be the risk genes. Those are some of the things that we're identifying in our genome-wide association studies that increase your risk of developing an eating disorder. 
but also what come with them are protective genes. So you might also have some genes that are inherited from either of your parents that might buffer or protect against those risk genes. So again, we're looking at probabilities on the genetic side. And these spades and clubs, that's what we're born with. Nothing we can do about that. Once the sperm and the egg meet, your DNA are set, your genome is defined, and those are the risk and protective genes that you'll be dealing with for the rest of your life. But what then modifies all that are the diamonds or the environmental risk factors. So things that can happen, the Shakespearean slings and arrows of outrageous fortune um, that can trip you up, that can get in your way, that can increase your risk of developing an eating disorder. But then, of course, the thing we all try to maximize are the environmental protective factors. So those things that can buffer the environmental factors, those things, the environmental risk factors, those things that can even buffer the effects of some of the genetic risk factors. And this is basically the way we need to consider the complexity of risk for developing an eating disorder by making sure we remember at all times that it's these four buckets of factors that contribute to any individual person's risk. And so, as we said, um, what you're dealt at birth are your spades and your clubs. So this person, for example, has a fairly high risk for eating disorders, was dealt four spades at birth, but also had a protective gene or a set of protective genes in there. We see that one club. Now, the little caveat that I will throw in is that intrauterine environment is actually important as well. So that's an environmental effect that might actually be sort of working um, before you're even born. So just keep that in mind. So we work with the hand that you're dealt with. We can't change our spades, we can't change our clubs. And the research that we're doing isn't about that. Um, the research that we're doing is leading towards discovering ways to interrupt or reduce or block the effects of those spades or whatever pathways those spades might assort into to influence your risk for developing an eating disorder. We can, of course, work to minimize the diamonds, those environmental risk factors. Or one of the things that parents can do and peers can do and therapy can do is change the way that we respond to or interpret those environmental risk factors. So that's something that can go on throughout the course of your life. And then finally, and I think this is what we all try to do for ourselves, for our children, for the people around us, and that's just maximize hearts. So really maximize those environmental protective factors that can just buffer you from all of the other risks, both genetic and environmental, that you may be encountered with in your life. But always remember, it's a game of chance, just like cards. There are things that we control in our life, but there are so many more things that are out of our control. And I think that's something to always keep in mind when thinking about risk and risk for developing eating disorders. So what can we do with this genetic information now? Well, we can integrate genetics into our personal narratives about causes of illness. I think when we think about, we always think about, why did this happen to me? Why did this happen to my child? Well, one of the ways to really build out that narrative more is to make sure that you include genetics. Do you have a family history of people who are very perfectionistic? Are there people in your family who have actually had eating disorders or maybe had behaviors that were like eating disorders, but they were never diagnosed? Um, it really just helps us create a more complete picture of the biology that might have predisposed someone to an eating disorder. I also suggest that people discuss genetics with their treatment team. Um, I've been training clinicians and we've been talking with clinicians about how to really come to the party and talk about how genes play a role in the development of eating disorders. And I also encourage people to be really matter of fact and just very forthcoming about family psychiatric history. You know, when we go to our primary care physicians, you know, we fill out checklists all the time about, yes, my family has, you know, high blood pressure, or has stroke, has a history of diabetes. Um, but when it comes to those psychiatric history questions, there's still this stigma that keeps people sometimes from clicking those boxes. But I would just encourage everyone to just make sure that they're forthcoming when they're talking about their family history of psychiatric illness and eating disorders as well, so that clinicians really know the full picture of what they're dealing with. 
I also encourage people to con consult a genetic counselor. In the United States and in many other countries, we do have people who specialize in genetic counseling. And even though they might be not be specifically trained in eating disorders, they can help you talk through these issues. They're not going to give you specific numbers like, you know, your child is at X percent increased risk for developing an eating disorder because our research doesn't support that but they will help you think through this complexity and just talk through what the risk might be. And then remember, and I think I use the genetic information in talking about this all the time, that recovery from eating disorders is hard and it is also an uphill battle against your biology. And I think that can help people understand more why it is so hard and why relapse happens and that this isn't just a choice to have the eating disorder again, but there's actually a struggle going on about some aspects of your biology that might be pulling you in a certain direction. So that deck of cards helps remind us that genes don't act alone. To replace ors with ands, no more of this genes or environment or nature or nurture, it's always genes and environment and nature and nurture. It reminds us to embrace complexity and embrace probabilities. And it tells us that genetic destiny doesn't make any sense for eating disorders. Yes, we're dealt those spades and clubs, but the diamonds and the hearts are equally as important. And to avoid genetic guilt, um, we can't help what genes we pass down. That is simply the luck of the draw. And so we can't feel guilty about that. We can just focus on those diamonds and those hearts and dealing with the environmental factors. The deck of cards also reminds us to avoid simplification. There's no such thing as the gene for a particular eating disorder. And I think it really clarifies why a genetic test simply cannot capture the complexity of risk. If someone comes to you and says, if you give me $1,000, I will tell you if your child is at risk for an eating disorder, you have to go right back to them and say, hey, um, how does your test actually tell me about genetic protective factors or environmental risk and protective factors? We do not have genetic tests that can give us that information today. <laughs>